A blessed good morning, everybody. Uh, to all, to all those in our Zoom, happy Lord's Day. To our uh, visitors, thank you for joining us as we come together and worship the Lord. And truly indeed that God lives in our hearts. And this morning, we will be uh, somehow talking about that song. We all know that life is not without its challenges, correct? And uh, these challenges, it, it comes in two ways. Number one, those challenges that we can solve. And number two, those challenges that we cannot solve. Okay. Now, the first one is um, when this kind of uh, challenges comes to us, we just simply apply the solutions that we have. So, ergo, the problem is no more. Okay? We have no more problems. Okay? The problem goes away. But sometimes, you know, these kinds of problems are challenging, but they are manageable. Okay? And uh, it is within our capabilities, within our God-given abilities to solve them. Now, the second type of problem, this is the one that is beyond our capabilities. Now, we don't have the solution to the challenges that we are facing. And these are the ones that overwhelm us and somehow that can devastate us. Now, so, when this type of uh, these types of challenges come to us, we are more prone to ask, where is God? We are more prone to ask, where is Jesus? Okay. Where is the Holy Spirit? Now, as we can see, it's hard for, for people having this kind of problem to see God because their minds are clouded up with these difficulties and they're are unable to see God. Okay. Now, here's the thing. If we can solve our problems, we don't seek God for help. Okay. We just do it in our own and be done with it and go on to our daily lives. Now, the downside of this, the problem with being self-sufficient is that we don't see the need for God. If you and I are able to solve our problems within our capabilities, that is being self-sufficient. The problem with that is we are not seeing our need for God. I can do this on my own. I don't need help. I don't need God. That is the problem. But when the problem is beyond us, and it is taking a toll on us, you know, physically, it's tiring us, emotionally, it is draining us, and also financially. Now we ask, where is God? Where is God when I need him? Where is God when I am in this turmoil? Why? Because the challenges that you and I are facing are beyond our capabilities. We are now becoming insufficient, okay? Unsufficient in our own, okay? Now, when life is good, when life is good, when, you know, there is no God, when life is good. When life is difficult, on the other hand, we question the existence of God. We even somehow <clears throat> blame God by saying, you know, if there's a loving God, then why did he do this, he, he, he did this to us? <clears throat> if there is a loving God, why these things happen to me? Okay. But when there is a big event in our life, you know, when we are celebrating, sometimes there is no God. But sometimes, you know, in our celebration, we normally start in general. I'm talking about gen general. 
when there's a big celebration, we normally start the celebration by asking someone to pray, right? You have a program. In the program, part one, number one, invocation. Prayer. Right? We ask someone. If the, pro, if the celebration is somewhat informal, and then we see someone who is more of a religious type person, we ask that person, can you pray before we celebrate? I'm not saying that it's bad. It's good. That is good. You know, a thanksgiving prayer to God. Now, we invite God to the occasion. But, there's the problem. But, after the prayer, what's next? After the prayer, what's next? We set aside God. Okay? We lead him out of the doorway. Why? Because here comes the booze. Here comes now, let the party start it. You know, and let the worldly talks take over. Okay. But when we are at the bottom, we beg God to come in. We beg God to come in into our lives and take control of our lives. But when we are celebrating, we just ask God for prayer. And then after that, be on your way. Be on your way. Okay. And sometimes we make a promise with God. We make a bargain with God. Lord, Lord, I promise I will be a good man from now on if you will just help me <clears throat> with my problems. We bargain with God. Now, quite ironic, isn't it? Quite ironic. In our scripture reading, in Luke chapter 24, verses 1 to 4, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. Now, what do you think they are wondering? What do you think these women are asking themselves? Where is Jesus? Right? When they went to the tomb, they saw an empty tomb. And they are probably wondering to themselves, where is Jesus? Now, that's the question they were probably asking themselves and lingering in their minds. Where could Jesus be? Who took Jesus? Where is he? Now, just like those women asking where Jesus was, in our desperate situations, my dear brethren and friends, we also ask, where is Jesus? So this morning, where is Jesus finding his presence when life is falling apart? That's the title of the message that I'll be sharing with you this morning. So number one, where is Jesus? <clears throat> Seated at the right hand of God. The Bible said in Mark chapter 16, verse 19. So then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. You know, <clears throat> so many things in life gives us worries. There's so many things. When you turn on your television, it stresses you. There's so much, there's so much bad news. Okay? So much crime, so much hatred, okay? so many unpleasant things happening around us. Many people don't want to turn on their TV because they're being stressed. And some people don't want to open their emails because there will be problems. Some people even don't want to open their mails because in the mails you will have your monthly problems, your monthly bills. So people are stressed over it, okay? So some people don't want those things, right? No. We are living in such a very stressful world, right? Now, before Jesus' death, he let his disciples know that he will soon go back to his Father in heaven. 
And somehow this brought sorrow to the disciples. Okay? They were sorrowful and they, and they worry. Okay? This brought worries to the disciples because their master and their teacher whom uh, with them for so long would be leaving them. Okay? Now the disciples knew that pretty soon they would also face hardships because they will be persecuted. They know that. Okay? <clears throat> now knowing the hearts of his disciples, Jesus comforted them. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And that is what God is saying to all of us today. Do not let your hearts be troubled over this stressful world that you are living in. You believe in God? Yes, we do. Believe also in me. Believe also in Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter of your faith. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there? For what? To prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. What a comforting words from Jesus himself. Not only these words were given to the apostles, Jesus is right now talking to us all. In this stressful world, trust in Jesus Christ. When Jesus went back to the Father, it was not meant to be a sorrowful event. It was not meant for the disciples to cry. No. No. It was a joyful event. Why do I say a joyful event? Because Jesus is going back to the Father. Okay? Seated at the right hand of God. And what does seated at the right hand of God means? It means Jesus conquered death. Going back to the Father means it's a joyful event for all of us because Jesus conquered death. Romans 8, 24, who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, we was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. <clears throat> okay. This means your obedient faith in Christ, my dear brethren, is not futile. Soon you will be reunited with Jesus Christ in heaven. Now, second, this means that your suffering, our challenges, our sorrows are temporary. They are just temporary because Jesus rose again and he is preparing a place for all of us. He is a, preparing a place for your arrival in heaven. Now, knowing that should give you comfort. Okay? So Jesus seated at the right hand of, of the Father is Jesus conquering death. Second, it means equality with God the Father. Being seated at the right hand of God means equality. First Peter chapter 3.22 He is on the right hand of God. Angels and authorities and powers being made subject to Him. That means that Jesus once again shared equal status with God. Shared equal status with the Godhead, the tree and God. In authority, in strength, and in glory. Philippians chapter 2 verse 6 tells us, Who, being in, the ve in, <clears throat> in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Philippians 2.16 tells us that Jesus, his very nature, is God. But while here on earth, he removed his cloth of being God. He removed that equality with God, but from the beginning, he is God and equal with God. And sharing this equality, Jesus now claim, can now claim his people when the judgment comes. 2 Timothy 4.8 
From now on, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but to all who crave for his appearing. That's why Jesus went back to the Father, seated at the right hand of God, so that you and I can have also heaven at the right time. Those who endure the pain, this world gives and remain faithful, you will reap the harvest. You will have heaven. Now, it is quite interesting to observe that those who question the existence of God, if you will think of it, okay, when they are suffering, those who question the very existence of God, when they are, when they read a hit rock bottom, are those who don't obey God. Okay. Those who look for God for comfort and hope are those who intentionally distance themselves from God. Those who question God's existence in the first place, they don't have God in their life. So now they are asking, where is God? While in their whole life, they have no God at all. While those, you and I, who are servants of God, we don't ask where is God when we are in trouble because we know where God is. But those who ask God where he is when they are in trouble, they are the ones who don't have God. They are the ones who don't believe God. They are the ones who are mocking God. And now they have the audacity to ask, where is God when I am in trouble? Now, why are people asking God where he is in the first place they don't believe in God? Why are they looking for God? The answer is because of pain and hope. It has something to do with pain and hope. That's why they are asking where is God? You know, people don't want pain. We don't want pain. People don't want suffering. We don't want to suffer. When a person is in so much pain, that excruciating pain is taking that person's hope of living. See? And when your hope is leaving you away, then you are now in fear. You will now fear. And what are you fearing? The fear of death. See? When one person can no longer bear the pain. He is losing hope. And when he is losing hope, he would ask God. Because something inside him is fearing him. Whatever that is. See? So we ask God where he is because there is pain and it is about hopelessness. See? They believe in God. You know, it's quite ironic because they don't have God they distance themselves away from God, but when they are suffering, at the back of their consciousness, they believe that there is God. They know that there is God. Because all of the things they have heard since childhood, all of the things they have heard from television, from the televangelists, you know, from the flyers, from the flyering that you are doing, all the things that they have read in those articles, somehow, at the back of their consciousness, they are somehow believing there is God. And hopefully, and hopefully there is God. You see? When somebody is losing hope and needed, needing cure, give that person anything and he will drink it. Why? He needed hope. He needed hope. You see? Hoping that God is real. Now, I remember during the onslaught of COVID-19, you know, many people turned to God. I was talking about this a while ago in our Bible study. Many people turned to God, looking for God. You know, even, those do, even those people that don't have COVID-19 in them, you know, they are coming to God. Why? Because of the emotional and psychological stress. 
you know, COVID-19 was giving to them. It's so much unbearable. You see, seeing your, your family members, seeing your friends, and seeing so many people unknown to you dying every day, that is so much to bear. And with that pain and the thought of hopelessness, because there's no cure back then, many people are calling to God. As I've said a while ago, many people are calling me, many people are texting me, many people are messaging me, people, names that I don't know, asking for prayers, asking for God. And I was overwhelmed. I was praising God because I was able to minister to these people. But then again, you know, these people are losing hope because they are now insufficient. Their sufficiency, they are not able to help themselves. You know, they are losing hope. So we turn to God. Now, there was a lesson. Let me share with you a lesson I learned during COVID-19. You know, during COVID-19, people kneel to God. Asking for healing, asking for mercy, and asking for cure. Now, all of us, even experts, they were all baffled by COVID-19. How to how to cure to to cure, how to have uh, vaccines. You know how to address this virus. Nobody knows what to do. That's why people are dying everywhere, every minute. People are dying around the world. Okay? Now, around the world, experts work round the clock, 24-7, to find a cure. Now, when finally, when finally, less than a year, there comes a vaccine. Unfortunately, many began to question the vaccine. Okay? Now, we respect those who don't take the vaccine. We respect those who don't believe in the vaccine. It is their right. But my point is, people are now, they began questioning the vaccines. And some people have this argument, you know, why were the vaccines formulated so fast? I was wondering, during the onslaught of COVID-19, we are asking for cure. We are praying to God for cure. And now here comes the vaccine. Many are asking why the vaccine came so fast, less than a year. I was thinking, why are we thinking that way? And many people, in my experience, just my experience back home, you know, just my experience, people are questioning the vaccines. They are having doubts about the vaccines. There are many of those people and very few we're thanking God for the vaccines, for the cure. Okay. Just many few people that I've talked to, they are thanking God. So many people are doubting. And now, during when the vaccines came out, many became an expert of COVID-19. They are giving their own opinion. Oh, this should be this, this should be that. I was sitting down, talking to myself. Where is this people when the COVID, you know, are, are taking so much life, lives? Where are they? Nobody's talking about the cure. But when the cure is here, many become an expert. And that is true. That is true. See? Now, people, here's the lesson. Again, the lesson is, People went back to their own old ways. Why? Pain and hope. Pain and hope. That tolls, the that toll declined. Okay. The pain was subsiding. You get the point? The pain was subsiding. Because there's now this cure. The pain was subsiding. And people now are seeing hope back again. When you, put, when you take away pain, it gives back hope. And when you have that hope, 
people become blinded and they will not see again God because they again become self-sufficient. And when you become self-sufficient, you don't see the need for God. And that is the problem when we can help our own self or our own selves. We are not seeing God. See. And this is the lesson I learned. People became self-sufficient. And when they became self-sufficient, their pain was gone. Their hope back again. And they are not seeing God again. The question, where is God? The second one, where is God? God is with us. Matthew 1, 23. Behold, the virgin will be, will be with child and will give birth to a son. And they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now, we all know that God is omnipresent. Omnipresent. He has been with us since he created everything, since he created the world. From time immemorial, man wanted to see God face to face. Yeah. God showed himself to, to Moses, but not his face. It was only his back. Okay. God manifested himself in so many ways in the Old Testament, through the burning bush, right? through all the miracles he did in the Old Testament, through the pillars of cloud and fire during when the people, the Israelites were in the wilderness. Okay. And... Uh, God manifested himself by giving the name I am. Okay. And finally, to fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah, God showed himself through the embodiment of Jesus Christ. Finally, finally, we see God through Jesus Christ. Jesus becoming man. Okay. God in human form. The world saw God for the first time in the flesh, in Jesus Christ. Now, Emmanuel is not just a name. Emmanuel is not just a name. It is God telling us that he is forever looking at us, looking after us, caring for us, and that we are not alone. You are not alone in your battle in life. Whatever you are going through in life, you are not alone. God is with you. Emmanuel, God is with us. Emmanuel. In fact, Jesus coming here on earth is God telling all of us, I feel you. Amen. I feel you. I feel your hurt. I feel your sufferings. I empathize with you. I felt your pain. I shed the tears. I bled with you. And I died for you. That is what Jesus, that is what God is trying to convey to, you, to us when he said, Emmanuel, God with us because I feel you. What you are going through. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Since he himself has gone through sufferings and testing, he is able to help us when we are being tested. He understands what we, we are going through. He suffered like you and me. I think... His, his, his sufferings are more severe. His pain are more painful than ours. You know, dying on the cross, being beaten by the Romans, by the Roman soldiers, being speared at your side, being having put on a, a, a torn of crowns over your head. I think Jesus suffered more than we do. God with us 
means I bring you comfort. God brought down comfort to all of us through His Son, Jesus Christ. He gave us Jesus. God sent His Son, Jesus, so that through His sufferings, through His death on the cross, we can find assurance and comfort in our trying times. Praise be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our troubles. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. Now, if any of us here are suffering, whatever you are going through, listen to the truth of God's word. The Bible tells us, for just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. Now, what does this share in the sufferings of Christ mean? What does it mean? Okay. That, does it mean that I must also physically suffer and emotionally suffer like what Jesus went through? No. But if that will be the case, if we'll come to that, then so be it. But it's more than that. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 gives us the answer. I have been crucified with Christ. Meaning my old self has been crucified with Christ and I no longer live but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is the type of suffering that we abundantly share with Jesus. When we nail our sinful nature on that cross with Jesus Christ. Okay? When we now think about the things that please the Spirit rather than what pleases our sinful nature, we suffer with Christ. When we let go of our search for our own happiness and our own satisfaction in exchange for seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, we suffer with Christ. When we love God more than anybody else, we suffer with Christ. So when you and I suffer with Christ, my dear brethren, make no mistake about this. God's comfort will abound upon you through Christ because you suffered with Him. When you suffered with Him, rest assured that comfort will abound in you. Amen to that. You see, it's such a, an amazing promise by God. Now, the third answer to where God is in all of these bad things happening to us, you know, God is exactly where He always has been. Loving you. That's where He's always been. Loving you. You know, inside this love of God is His care, His comfort, His faithfulness, His love, suffering. You know, when, when things are overwhelming us and seems like everything is going wrong, when life is falling apart, we can trust in the promise of God. Now, written in the Bible, it says, the, st the steadfast love of God, of the Lord, never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. In other translations, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed for His compassion. Never fails. Now, the book of Lament Lamentations is about the cry of Jeremiah. Deep the pain that Jeremiah is feeling. It deals with the suffering of God's people in their dire situations. You know, Jerusalem had fallen to the great Babylon. But amid the tragedy, amid the mourning, 
there is this wonderful little verse that gives hope to the Israelites and to all of us until this very day. We can get the same hope, the same comfort, the same courage from this verse as did the Israelites before. Again, it, it is so easy to be tempted to think that God had left our side, that God doesn't love us when we are overwhelmed with so much challenges, so much suffering. You see, the book of Lamentation is a book that also tells us that God is, is a great God that loved us so much. That whatever we are going through, whatever you are going through, God is there for you no matter what. Now first, Lamentations chapter 3 tells us the, the steadfast love of the Lord. What is the meaning of steadfast? It means reliable. It means dependable. It means immovable. It means unwavering. Now you get the picture. You get the picture of what the steadfast means. God's love for you is unwavering. It is not going anywhere. It will not budge. It is there waiting for you. And it also says it never ceases. It means not coming to an end, not stopping, not fading away, not quitting. God's love is not shrinking. He will not stop loving us. God's love is steadfast and never ceases because that is who God is. Remember, God is love. Amen? God is love. Now, the steadfast love of God never ceases means there is nothing you and I could do to diminish that love because that is who God is. He is love. Now, whatever you and I do, God will continue to offer his love for us. Again, his love is not budging. Whatever we are facing, God is there loving us. Then when we finally come to our senses, when we finally decided to come to God, turn to God and accept him, his love will always be there waiting for you. Now it also says his mercies, his mercies, that is God's compassion. His mercies never end. His mercies will never come to an end. It will never cease as well. Now, I want all of us to see this. For example, this is God right here. God is love. The mercies, the compassion, the faithfulness, the long-suffering, it emanates from God. It is who God is. It is God's expression of his love. God is love, and in that expression of love comes mercy, comes grace, comes faithfulness, comes long-suffering, and comes forgiveness. All of those are God's expression of his love. That's why it says, his mercies shall also never cease. Just like his love will never cease. All of his expression of love also will never cease. They are new every morning. Now you always hear me say, every morning is a blessing. Every morning is a blessing because every time we wake up, we are greeted with God's love and mercy. Amen? Every morning you, you, you open your eyes, you are greeted with God's love and mercy. You know, it's always there when you wake up. Your very life itself is a blessing from God. I hope you are seeing this every morning when you wake up. I hope you see God's blessing every morning. I hope you see God's love every morning. I hope you see God's mercy every morning because God said they are new every morning. They are new every day when you wake up. They are new every day when you open your eyes. Then if you are not seeing that, I want you to open the eyes of your heart and see that wonderful blessings from God. 
You see, Psalm 23, verse 6 tells us, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me, will follow you all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord. It is following you. God is always there for you. God is always there beside you. They are new every morning, and it is following you. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. You see, every time, we're, whenever I go, I know that God is with me. Whenever I'm driving, I know that God is with me. Why? Because His mercy never ceases to end. They are new every morning. And His goodness and mercy is following me. His goodness and mercy is following you. See? When Brother Carlos is painting, God is there to protect him. When you are doing your things, God is there to protect you. His mercy is there. So God is with us all this time. God has always been here with us. He never left our side. You know, like our parents. When they are trying to teach us how to ride a bicycle. From the moment, the first time they will let go of the bicycle. And when they see you swerving, they will, oh, oh, oh. They will go there and rush towards you because they don't want you to, 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 to fall on the ground and hurt yourself. See, that's how they love you. That's how they love us. And that's how God loves you and I. He doesn't want you to be hurt. See, Unfortunately, despite of God's goodness, we rebel against God and we don't see the undying love of God. Don't you see how wonderfully kind Tolerant and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that His kindness is intended to turn us, to turn you from your sin? Then when finally, when we are so down, we dare to question, where is God? When all along, since our birth, God is there beside us. He is there with us. Now, this wonderful promise of God is only made available as long as we are alive. You know, as we are alive. When we breathed our last and missed that chance, you miss a great opportunity, my dear brethren and friends. Now, having said all these things, the real question is not if God loves you. But do you love God? It is not if God cares for you, but do you care for God? The question is not where is God in all of this. The real question is where is God in your life before, during, and after all of this? That is the real question question. In your difficult times, take this as an opportunity, you know, to seek God. To see God and appreciate God, you know, for who He is. Then with a clear mind, a repentant heart, and a humble spirit, let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. My dear brethren and friends, the gospel is yours. Where is God? He is here with you all the time. If you have not yet received Jesus, we are sending this invitation out to you. Please come forward. Declare your submission to Christ. Repent of your sins, be baptized into his name so that you will receive the promise of heaven. May I now invite the congregation to please stand as we sing the song of invitation. God bless us all. Good morning. <laughs>